Hello, everyone, and good day to all of you who are joining us from everywhere around the world. Thank you so much for joining us today for this live nomoneylaundering.com web seminar broadcast. In the next 60 minutes, uh, our speakers will discuss data quality automation, uh, specifically proactive data validation. Next slide, please. All right, my name is Anna Sayer. I will be your moderator today. I would like to just like to extend a special welcome to our loyal AML Services plan members and also a warm welcome to any new attendees who may be joining us for this nomoneylaundering.com webinar for the very first time today. So welcome to everyone. Next slide. Our speakers uh, today will be Idan Carrot, Jeff Nelson, and Bob Smith. Just a brief little intro about each. Um, Idan is actually head of America's operations for Matrix, who is sponsoring this webinar. He has over 18 years of experience in the financial crime field uh, and has worked as a consultant for financial institutions such as uh, BNP Paribas and Deutsche Bank as well. The second speaker, Mr. Jeff Nelson, is Managing Director of Financial Crimes and Compliance at Pitney Bowes. Uh, he brings with him 14 years of experience in the financial services industry in the areas of regulatory compliance, sanctions, and AML. Uh, thirdly, our speaker will be Bob Smith. Bob is Managing Director of Financial Crimes and Compliance at Pitney Bowes Software. So Bob, from the technical side, comes with 25 years of experience in the software industry, uh, where he's focused on uh, data quality and data management for banking and financial services organizations. So they have a huge breadth of experience that come here today. Uh, guys, take it away. Thank you, Anna. Welcome, everyone. I think we'll start with covering uh, the agenda for today. If we can move forward to that slide, please. So in today's session, we're going to do a little intro into the topic of data quality. We're going to talk about the data quality challenges that uh, firms are facing today, talk about a concept of data quality scoring. We'll talk about data quality automation. And then we'll shift into starting to talk about how to resolve some of these ideas and concepts that we'll, we'll bring up as issues, um, types of data issues that people face, a specific issue around address challenges, and then how we connect a lot of dots in preparing around items such as relationship matching. Data quality is front and center these days. It's on the minds of the regulators and it's on the minds of the C-suite within financial institutions. We're now two decades into trying to combat financial crime within this digital age, but the combination of growing evidence of losses tied to regulatory scrutiny uh, with reputational risk married with the evolution of better technologies is leading us toward the new approach to performing and achieving data quality within the global financial sector. Next slide, please. Evidence of the effects of poor data quality are pretty easy to find with numerous regulatory declarations and fines being reported monthly. If you look on your screen, you're gonna see just a few samples from the last few months. One example over incorrect data flowing downstream affecting trading, and one over a firm missing critical data feeds within their AML transaction monitoring. Ignoring the problem of data quality is no longer really an option. The real question is how to address it, and that's what we'll be trying to address in the webinar series that we're starting here today. Next slide. In our three-part series, we'll be presenting a journey, if you will, of how customer data improvement and overall data flowing through the financial system can influence and improve the results of your institution and reduce exposure. Overall, effective compliance demands a golden record, golden source, pretty much a single source for all your financial crime and compliance processes. That needs to become even more critical given the latest enhancements in artificial intelligence and machine learning, which try to leverage the big data lakes and the cloud environments that are being built out as a source to support analytics. The need to assure that your underlying information being fed into these reporting and supervising systems is accurate and will not expose your institution to external and internal audit and scrutiny becomes crucial. Today's session covers how data quality is key to downstream financial crime systems and how to look for and implement data quality efficiency. 
On a follow-up session that we'll be holding September 12th, we'll talk about leveraging non-obvious account matching for customer risk rating, segmentation, and efficiency in transaction monitoring and fraud prevention systems. We'll close out our webinar series on October 11th, where we will talk about how to utilize the value of data quality in accounts, linking them to deliver efficiency to financial crime systems and the FIUs. Data drives our ability as financial crime experts. We rely on it to initiate effective prevention, whether it's in AML or whether it's in fraud. Poor data affects our ability to have a true sense of the customer's interaction with the firm. The term used these days of having a 360 degree view of a customer cannot be fully achieved without it. Another example is that poor data leads to false positive alerts in our transaction monitoring and affects our FIU's ability to execute optimal. In addition, we have a lot of duplications of investigative efforts due to inability to connect between similar entities and basically duplicating efforts. Let's focus for a moment on that first point as an example, KYC. Within Know Your Customer, the KYC environment, firms must ask themselves whether they truly know how a customer interacts with their firm. If they're unaware of the full context of the individual working relationship with the institution, given they have inadequate means of correlating information across parts of the organization, and more importantly, not being able to decipher individual connections tied to data that is misrepresented or simply presented in a varied structure. As an example, a Mr. Robert Smith checking account and a Mr. Rob A. Smith trading account who have the same address, same social security number, surely should be viewed as one client when it comes to evaluating their risk and financial crime exposure within the institution. Now, whether it's artificial intelligence or if you define things as just machine learning, and whether it's algorithms that are supervised or not, given the vast amounts of data sets within the firms today, they cannot be useful without reliable data quality. So more attention should be paid to data collection, storage, preparation practices before data analysis should take place. Moreover, without the ability of senior management to track the improvement of data quality, it'll make it harder to be convinced of the sh and showing strong returns from the new investments in AI and machine learning coming to displace and augment rule-based analysis that's been in the works for many years. To truly be able to evaluate data quality and work towards measurable governance, programs that firms are doing should strive to trace the data from upstream points and to their end state. All sources, all stages of data, through manipulations, through to the field-by-field -field level evaluation. To truly be able to qualify the state of the data it means the ability to understand the underlying use of the data downstream, and that varies from one technology solution to the next and from one business line usage to the next. As illustrated at the beginning of this session, a firm could be fined just for having lack of awareness to the fact that certain portions of data were not captured in their process. So no step can be skipped. Let's talk about what we can track towards improvement. Let's take just a few examples. We can track individual relationship and entity relationships and try to improve on those. We can try to track and evaluate whether we're adhering to certain formats of data, evaluate missing data, evaluate hidden correlations between the entities, evaluate whether new product types have been uh, introduced into our environment without us being aware, new transactions or activity types as the business evolves historical averages, volume tracking, all of these are starting points for you to think about as you build out your data quality process. Each firm can establish your own set of queries. The key is to be comprehensive as possible. Now we view a need for a new and deterministic measure of data quality. We encourage all firms to define a scale and report it periodically with a clear and continuous path towards the gold source perfection. Although it's known that this concept of perfection when it relates to data is financially difficult and it takes a great deal of enterprise level coordination, it is achievable. Improvement towards this goal is very much achievable. The return on that investment is what we're touching upon throughout this three-part webinar series.
In recent decades, firms have been focusing on getting basic financial crime and compliance programs up and running under duress of timelines with a lot of pressure by management teams and regulators expecting to see systems up more than they were expecting quality out of them. This has led to what today a lot of people deem as the day two data quality problem. Systems were initiated with faulty data. They've never been aimed for cleanup. The only way to assure improvement is to add programmatic data quality automation layers on top of what a lot of firms has built out as a centralized golden source attempt and run these procedures and daily processes consistently. Compliance and financial crime leadership should be exposed to a score of the firm as well as the C-suite leadership. Tracking your DQS should be the same as tracking your company's revenue numbers, something of a routine, not an afterthought. So in summary, we would like to see firms achieve the following. Implement an automatic mechanism to consistently evaluate all data records for quality. Create a visual mechanism for external parties to be aware of the decision-making behind the scenes. Establish a clear process to review and administer a corrective process. And then define a data quality score and see your year-over-year -year client score improvement. Now, I want to shift this to a quick polling question here and get a little bit of sense from all of you out there as to where you are today with your process. So the question is, is data quality an issue that your bank has already identified? And if you can please answer to one of the following, we have no data quality issues would be the one option. We have data quality issues, but it's not a priority. We have data quality issues and it is a priority. We have data quality issues. Um, it's a priority, but it falls to the enterprise level and that's out of my domain. I'll give everybody a quick opportunity to answer that. Excellent. So those are pretty much expected um, results from the market as we see it today. And I think that would be a good intro uh, for you, Bob, to continue to discuss and present to everybody how we can address data quality issues and how we suggest for people to start working on solutions to the problem. Yeah, that's good news. All right. Um, second speaker, this is actually Bob Smith. Not Jeff Nelson. I say that because Jeff takes particular pride in his presentation, so I don't want there to be any confusion. <laughs> Don brought up a number of good reasons why a focus on AML data quality makes sense. So you might ask, I know I do, why don't AML groups address data quality challenges? Uh, Penny Bowes has been working on data quality challenges for 30 years, and we hear three predominant answers to this question from AML officers and AML process owners. Uh, first one, we don't own the customer data. Uh, we also hear my EDM group is building an MDM system, or sometimes too, I threw that in because <laughs> I've heard that before, I thought it was kind of funny. Um, and the next one is, geez, if I were to take on data quality, uh, I would need to launch an entire new initiative to clean the customer data. So we hear other objections as well, but we hear these three so often I wanted to discuss each of them and then show you how our solution addresses these concerns. At a very high level, what our solution does is just make a slight change to the way data flows through your AML processes to enable a data quality automation that Adam was referring to. This changes the AML, uh, change provides the AML group with clean, connected customer data in your processes. And then uh, after me, Jeff will spend some time talking about some capabilities that make up our solution. Uh, on, the, on the next slide, so the first one, we don't own the customer data. Uh, we're often told uh, the lines of business own the customer data, and AML has the then unenviable job of receiving data from all the lines of business and trying to connect it together to develop risk ratings, perform customer segmentation, et cetera. The challenge with line of business ownership is that every source system can have different data standards, and often they do. Of course, the AML group is never going to go back upstream and force the line of businesses to use the same validation and standardization routines. Um, our solution addresses these challenges by introducing an AML-specific data hub right before the transaction monitoring system. Um, in this scenario, uh, lines of business send data to the AML group. It's already being done today. 
Um, what we do is we clean, standardize, and normalize to a single AML quality standard and place that data into the AML data hub. I'm emphasizing that this is an AML data hub because that's how we ensure that AML ownership and therefore success to AML teams uh, by giving them direct access and some level of control over that customer information. Now, as a side benefit, the hub also provides the AML group with another capability that regulators are increasingly asking for, data governance. You know, where is this data coming from? What are you doing to it? Uh, our solution keeps a complete audit trail of every change made to the data uh, from the time it comes into your control. A at the end of the day, you may not own the customer data, but you will own a copy uh, that is clean and connected for your use within your processes. On the next slide, uh, when we get into discussions of giving some control over the data to AML, we sometimes hear this next objection, which is my EDM group is responsible or already building an MDM system. So having worked on numerous MDM initiatives, they certainly deliver value to an enterprise, but they're not necessarily a bullseye for AML. I've sat at huge tables of stakeholders for MDM projects and seen maybe five people from marketing, four from sales, three from product, and then maybe one from AML. So you don't necessarily have the power in the room uh, to negotiate all the data that's going into the system. And your data needs are extensive and quite important from a regulatory perspective. Um, some of the issues we see in these MDM systems is they don't often include all of the critical data needed for AML and compliance. For instance, um, AML risk and segmentation data or some level of transaction data. Uh, also, many MDMs don't include data from every source that you might need to pull from, resulting in some of the data, same data collisions we focused in on the last slide. Finally, because AML does not own the MDM, insights that you uncover, for instance, you know, insights about customer activities in the FIU, don't necessarily get stored back into the MDM. So where are you going to put the critical investigative knowledge that you're developing. Um, our approach, again, changes this very slightly, is that we work cooperatively with the MDMs. So MDMs are sending information to AML. AML can then retain in that data hub the information that you'll need for your processes, and often uh, might send updates back to the MDM. If you're going in to do some rigorous investigations and creating new insight, or fixing some data or some relationship information, you could send that back to the MDM. So we're thereby improving the MDM by working cooperatively with it. Um, but because we're providing AML ownership of the AML data hub, we're ensuring the collision of the, the inclusion of all of the AML critical data elements, including a little transaction data, which allows us to develop transaction networks in our graph data hub structure. On the next slide, Finally, what we often hear is when discussing AML taking charge of the customer data, wow, geez, if I was, again, going to take on this uh, clean data initiative, I would need to launch an entire new team or group of people. And in our experience, that's not actually the case. Uh, implementing an ETM system or any other AML component typically requires a significant ETL effort to move data from the lines of business to your group while transforming the data. Uh, our solution can leverage the ETL logic already in place, or in many cases, enhance or improve some of the validation or standardization, standardization routines. One change we will make to the process is we'll write all this clean data into the data hub uh, rather than writing it directly into the TM. Uh, that really allows you to get multiple benefits from the same effort of moving and cleaning the data because the data hub is leveraged before, during, and after transaction monitoring. It's also a place where we maintain that high quality customer data that Don was telling us about. We often find that once we deploy the data hub, we begin fielding questions from other FCC process owners, wondering how AML compiled all this clean connected data. Good news is the data hub can be leveraged by other FCC organizations, fraud, supervision, compliance, uh, really anyone else who needs that information and, and the nice thing about leveraging it in that way is it's consistent information. Again, um, the transformation and the movement of data, you know, we're ensuring the consistency of it by providing access to that hub. On the next slide, 
actually two slides, the, we're depicting the changes we make to the flow of data. And while the change is not very large, it, it can create some large benefits in the delivery of that high quality information and the ability of you to maintain that information in a consistent manner. Um, we're going to spend a little bit more time on these slides in the second webinar of the series, which Don told you about, um, but I'll give you the primary changes. The, the first slide depicts the flow of the data from the LAB line of business source systems directly into a transaction monitoring system, which we often see. Um, the two primary changes you see between the two slides is on the front end, we're flowing the data into the AML data hub, then into the TM. This allows us to maintain the quality of the data hub and support accurate segmentation, accurate risk rating, et cetera, system processes that are going to take place before TM. Um, and then it's leveraged within the transaction monitoring system just by writing. Uh, and then on the back of the transaction monitoring system, what you see is the investigators in the FIU have then direct access back to the data hub. And that system, that data hub that we're creating is providing some visualization, some understanding of transaction networks, Etc. So a lot of insight being generated and provided directly to FIU. On the next slide, what you see is that we're, we're, same, we're moving the same data from lines of business into the data quality hub rather than directly into the TM, informing the TM of all the information that we have and providing the better, the good quality data. Uh, and then, like I said, the FIU has the direct access. In the next uh, webinar, what we'll talk about is how we create and maintain the holistic customer view in the data hub. But for now, uh, we have another polling question. And then Jeff will give you some more details on how the solution works. Uh, poll question number two. If you have identified data quality as an issue, what prevents you from seeking solutions? First, uh, we acknowledge we have a data quality problem, but don't know where to start. Number two, we're currently looking for data quality solutions. Number three, we're currently deploying data quality solutions, which is great. And number four, although data quality is an issue, our financial crimes group does not have responsibility for it. Thank you, Bob. As uh, people continue to vote, I will introduce myself briefly. My name is Jeff Nelson, your third and final speaker for the session today. I will uh, take a look at the answer to these questions and poll questions here in a few minutes and give you my two cents as to where it stands within the marketplace. And then we'll talk a little bit about what some of the data quality solutions uh, are delivering to some of the banks. Okay, actually uh, relatively interesting to see the results uh, with deploying the data quality solutions today leading the way. And um, we know we have data quality problems. If, if you actually look at the evolution of data quality and data quality challenges in the financial crime space, it's pretty evident that the first step is, is the acknowledgement that it is challenging. And if, you, and if you attend webinars like these or you attend different industry events, you see that there is an acknowledgement that data quality is a problem and it hinders um, financial crime solutions uh, and technologies downstream. Once it's acknowledged, the traditional path is to let the enterprise deal with that. There's traditionally a CIO or CDO who has responsibility for the data. Uh, the financial crimes group spends some time uh, with that group in order to identify what challenges are there and they run into a handful of roadblocks being that every line of business owns their owns their customer data and they don't want folks necessarily touching it. And that evolution traditionally takes anywhere from 24 to 48 months and the financial crimes group decides they need to do it for themselves. So I applaud for all of you who are deploying data quality solutions. That's typically what ends up being the end result is the financial crimes group takes that information and decides to apply it to their own solution and to fix it for themselves with a copy of the data uh, as Bob had described. Now this copy of the data does, does not mean that the line of business necessarily takes a copy of that data, though traditionally that's what, that's what ends up happening. So if we talk about data sources across the enterprise and we talk about data quality, the first thing that you have to absolutely do is have access to the data. And I'm gonna talk about the customer information file, but we're gonna want data that comes from all over the organization whether it's transactions, whether it's customer PII, whether it's the inside the customer information file, whether the information comes from your dot-com group, your ATM group, your call center group, your mobile device group, there's PII data that resides throughout the enterprise in every single one of those systems. And traditionally what you find in access that data 
and then you go take a look at it, and that's where data quality is glaring. There's information that's structured, unstructured, parsed, unparsed, missing, misfielded, unformatted, incorrect. And that challenge of that data is into sorting that information without having the customer on the line at that time. What you'll see on the next slide is a visual example of what PII information can actually look like. Next slide. Excellent, thank you. What you'll see is this is actually what the PII information can look like. If we start in the top left and we go around, uh, go around in a clockwise format, you'll see an incomplete street, misfielded address, missing information, unformatted data, misfielded data, data with a format variation. If you look at the dates of birth, one says 17 JUL 75, the other one says 17 7 1975. Uh, you could also have 7 17 75 as well, and a, and a handful of variations around that. And that's a challenge that you have when you pull in data from different data sources. Missing country, incorrect zip code, incorrect city, spelling errors, unparsed information, directional information, and name variations. And I'll speak to name variations uh, and addressing in just a moment. What we traditionally get asked when we first have a conversation with our client is, is how bad does my data actually look? And if you look on the next slide, I'm going to show you is two simple dashboards of what some of the data components that sit out there. The first thing that we do is we look at a total score. And the total score can be weighted separately and differently by data elements. But we also look at every single data element. We look at variations in the data and format variations in the data. And then we come up with an overall score. One would expect that banks today have a score in the high 90, 95 plus percentile. The reason it should be this high is because this is your customer data. These are not prospects. These are not marketing lists. These are your customers. You should know who they are. You should know where they live. You should know all the PII data that comes from them. You should know and understand the entire totality of their relationship with the bank. You should also know what network they are part of. Who are the rest of their family members? What businesses are they involved in? Who do they transact with? So traditionally, we find this to be at a good score in the high 90th percentile. On the right side, you'll simply see a data profiling results based on uh, different data elements where we could look at variations or frequency of characters in order to determine how good and how bad that data is. Now we have organizations that look at their data on a daily basis, weekly basis, monthly basis, and are tracking progress. One of the beauties of this data profiling tool is accessing and understanding which data silos are causing you the most trouble. So what maybe particularly what line of business should you be talking to first? around them capturing proper customer information during onboarding or during account servicing. On the next slide, what you'll see is I'll take, I'll take uh, two um, data element components, one being the address, which is critically important, and one of the fab four when you consider name, address, date of birth, and government ID. If you look at 90265 Pacific Coast Highway, PCH, Malibu, California, 22164, the first question to be asked is, does the address actually exist? Which set of numbers is the house number versus the zip code? Is 90265 the zip code or is 90265 the house? Is CA, is that representative of Canada or is that representative of California? Because we don't have a country listed here. And what we'll find is when we actually go through a validation process is that we'll append USA because we realize that Malibu is in California. We'll switch the house number and the zip code to make sure that they are properly aligned and properly understood. We will tell you also that this is a residential address. We'll tell you that this is a gated community and not postal deliverable. If we take a look at example at 1042 Laurel Road, London, 40746, we do the same validation process and we realize that 1042, that Laurel Road does not exist. In fact, it's South Laurel Road. Why is that important? If you have a customer that has an address of 1042 Laurel Road and a customer that has an address at 1042 South Laurel Road, they are in fact the same address. One is corrected to be properly uh, uh, corrected based on the United States Postal Standard. What we'll actually also determine is that this address is in the state of Kentucky and in the United States. And in fact, we're also able to identify that this is a commercial address and it's a commercial mailing receiving agency. So if you've ever heard of uh, the UPS store or the mailboxes, et cetera, 
This is an address that is actually one of those locations where a consumer has an actual address uh, at that location in order to receive mail. If you have any responsibility for fraud, this is a key indicator uh, of potential fraud if that's what's delivered as their residential address. Now, those two examples with Malibu and London, Kentucky, don't necessarily get all that challenging. What if you start adding international address? How about Rua Marechal Del Doro 135 SP Granja Julieta São Paulo 14738? What's address line one? What's address line two? Which one's the city? Which one's the state? Which one's the zip code versus the house number? Is the format proper? And that's the key uh, component in which you should uh, be looking at information. So in summary, for the address component, on the next slide, what you'll see is one of the data components that we try to look for. The first thing is to standardize, validate, and format the address for 240 global geographies. Where there is information that is incomplete, we complete or correct the proper address. Also determine if the address is valid or invalid. Is it residential or is it commercial? Is it a high rise and requires a suite number or an apartment number? Is it abandoned? Is it seasonal? So on the next slide, what you'll see is a few examples of some of the input addresses that came into the system and some of the addresses that came out. And though I could go through these one by one, you could see that the formatting components and the data validation components and properly parsing the information is critically important. More so if you're in the corresponding bank business and you have addresses that don't have countries and you may need to append a country to properly understand its potential risk. On the next slide, is simply a brief overview of the number of countries in which uh, you ought to have certification in. So if you're looking for a solution that goes down the addressing path, it is uh, encouraged that you look for a solution that is global in nature, because even though you are a global bank or may not be, you certainly could potentially have customers or transactions occurring globally. But understanding that having certification in those countries based on local postal authorities is key. If you use Google, to match addresses and to validate addresses. I will tell you that Google is not a reliable solution for address validation. Google will always give you an answer, even if the answer is wrong. So consider a solution that is certified by local postal authorities in the uh, different uh, parts of the world. I'm gonna step away from addresses for just a moment. And on the next slide, what you'll see is uh, understanding names and name variations. Now, there's a couple of different ways to do name and name variation. The first one would be, if you look on the left side of your screen, there are about 24, 25, 26 different algorithms. And those use this, um, analytic uh, systems and, and methodologies and algorithms to look at metaphones, sound decks, name variants, uh, different components, uh, distance on a keyboard, what that might be. And those can find you the Bobby with an I and the Bobby with a Y. They're close enough in what they sound like that you can actually find those names to be a potential match. What I would also consider, though, is a second way in which to also look at name variations. And that means bringing in a table with name variations. So at PB, specifically, we deliver a table with 2.2 million names that have first name variants, uh, distinct first names, last names variations, nicknames, genders, spellings of different names. The importance on this is if you look at the name Frank, Francis, Francisco, Francesco, and Paco. There's not an algorithm in this world that's going to match the name Baco to the name Francis. With 2.2 million name table, we'll absolutely be able to tell you that a variation of the two names, Baco Nelson and Nelson Paco, so long as there's other PII in order to connect those two customers, we're not suggesting that you change the person's name, but simply that you consider it to be a match. On the next slide, what you'll see is a handful of examples of some of the name challenges and data cleansing and parsing components that we address. If you look at the second uh, person's down in the input name, Sir Philip Mahoney Esquire, a traditional name parser may look at that name and determine that the word Sir is the first name and ESQ for Esquire is the last name, which is not necessarily correct. We understand titles of respect and suffix in names in order to properly pull those data components out. If you look at the fourth uh, example down, Captain Sanha Navy Clouset, we understand that Captain is a title of respect. Navy is not a representation of a person's name. If you go down about halfway down, you'll see on the input name 18RAH1M. 
What we do is we look at the names and the name variations and we look at the tables and we look at what other characters are in there and what they could re represent as names. Through the name variation of validation process, we can actually determine that that person's name is Ibrahim Hassan. And in that name, we understand that those data components are, are uh, that, that are numbers should actually not be in there because there should be letters. So we did a transposition of what those numbers should be as letters. If you look at about two thirds of the way down, you have Chong, C, period, Hong, Gang, G, period, A, period, and G. Again, the same types of situation. We're able to extract those periods, those special characters that should not necessarily be in there so that we can then understand what the name should actually look like which is title respect, first name, middle name, last name, as well as a suffix. So those are just some of the examples uh, that we've been able to see in the past. And if you have followed things uh, from Danske Bank and HSBC uh, over the past few months, you'll notice that some of those name components uh, and those special characters within the names were critically key in order to avoid detection internally. On the next slide, what I'm going to do is share simply some of the data components that we traditionally look to our customers to tackle from a data quality perspective. There is a traditional name, address, date of birth, and in the U.S.'s case, a social security number. The reality is, is that there's data that sits out there throughout the enterprise with a driver's license number, maybe a passport number, a home phone, work phone, cell phone, email address, social handle, IP address, MAC address, .com password, ATM PIN number, mobile device ID, all different data PII data components, which all need uh, some sort of data quality uh, resolution in order to standardize and validate which ones those are. So what we're suggesting, and we talked about at the beginning, was is when you go access information throughout the enterprise and you look at your multiple data sources, do consider going into these different data sources, especially your .com site, your mobile device IT group, maybe your call center caller ID number, your ATM PIN numbers group, all those data components uh, have different data components that can be used uh, for the customer. On the next slide, I'll share briefly with you just a, a handful of recent examples of, of some of the clients that have experienced uh, some value with data quality being the first step in their process. The first one is a super regional bank in the United States with around 18 million customers. And they were cited and had a consent order and a cease and desist order um, that they were uh, having to address. One of the very specific things in the, within the consent order was a holistic view of customer. Uh, your screening alert volume was extremely high and especially delayed. Uh, it was specifically identified that there was no single view of the customer. The one that was built was built for the purpose of marketing. And the first thing that they had to, adru uh, they had to um, address was the data quality and data profiling assessment. And what they initially realized is that their data quality was the foundation for the problems downstream. And when I said that banks should be in the high 90th percentile, uh, within that data quality and data profiling assessment. These folks were nowhere close to that, and that's what they had to address first. And what we did was, simply with um, some holistic view of the customer, but primarily data quality, is created efficiency over 35% in less than six months, and we have since then uh, increased the efficiency within that organization. The second one is a bank with 45 million customers, a national bank here in the United States as well, had challenges with alert volume and false negatives, uh, and what we did was we simply looked at the name and name variation of what was being hit by the, by the client on their screening engine uh, and what their client names were. And we were able to reduce their alerts by 58% simply by understanding name, variations, spellings uh, that came out of those systems. The third one is a U.S.-based global bank with over 100 million customers. They had over 120,000 high-risk customers. And the feds had asked them to take 8,000 of those 120,000 high-risk customers and understand their global footprint throughout the world. In order to do that, they hired 2,000 people who would manually log into different systems with a cheat sheet, a book that sat on their desk beside them with what they believed to be name variations. Well, clear to say that the, the 8,000 that they tried to deliver manually that way did not work. And had the feds asked them to do that for the 120,000 high risk customers, that would have been over $100 million in payroll. So astonishing numbers when you look at variations in, in data quality. I believe we have a poll question coming up. I would like to read those questions out to you and see um, what type of response we could get. Question number three, how likely is your organization to invest in data quality over the next 18 months? 
Unlikely, we have not planned to invest in data quality. Somewhat likely, there's been some discussion over the matter. Very likely, there's a plan to invest in data quality over the next 18 months. We recently invested in data quality, and we are already in the process of improving our data quality. I'll give you a moment to answer those questions, and we will address them briefly. I also would encourage you uh, at this time while you are entering your answers in there and, and we are uh, pulling the poll together. If you have any questions of this group, please feel free to um, fill in the, the question uh, on the, uh, in the GoToWebinar system and we will be happy to answer any questions as we are able. Okay, so, uh, so actually these are, these are excellent results. Uh, it, it tells me that data quality is front and center and organizations are taking notice. I'm going to venture to say that most of you have realized that data quality has been a challenge. You have also uh, asked the enterprise to help you with data quality. And my guess is that some of you folks may have had an enterprise that was willing to do that or nimble enough to do that, uh, whereas other, other folks have actually decided to take that project in and upon yourself. So excellent news. That is typically what we see in that direction, uh, and all of that is, is good news for us. On the next slide, you'll simply see an email address. Um, that would, if you would like to contact us, uh, you could certainly touch, um, reach out and touch base with us if we can help you answer any questions. I simply at this point want to reiterate that today we uh, went over the data quality automation uh, webinar. We intended this to be one of three webinars with a second webinar and third webinar coming up. Um, as well, and there will be a follow-up to the data quality. So once you have good data, data quality, what is it that you can do in order to create effectiveness and efficiency in your different financial crime systems? So you'll be receiving a link out to part two and part three as well. Please feel free to join and have your friends attend as well. I believe we'll open it up to questions. Okay, great guys. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, we're going to just open it up to a few questions now. I already have a few that came in, so we can get started with those while people submit uh, other questions they may have. Um, this is kind of an open for any any uh, speaker, Jeff uh, or, or um, Idan or whoever would like to, Bob, would like to answer. Um, this question uh, is asking about something quite practical, and um, this is whether or not there's a dedicated site um, where uh, an international company can go for guidance about U.S. client onboarding, AML, and CTF legislation. Is there a particular website or document that you would point people towards? So the, the CIP process, um, the Customer Identification Program in the U.S., uh, is a is a re there is a regulatory requirement around it. There are several documents that are written uh, around them specifically, but none of them address exactly what it is that needs to be accomplished other than the, the KYC and, uh, process in and of itself. And a lot of that interpretation is left to the banks to specifically determine what it is that is the requirement and either the banks or the advisory firms that advise in this particular area. So there's a lot of documentation around it, but the interpretation is certainly left out to the bank in order to identify and be comfortable enough that they understand who their customers are. Sure, um, but just in terms of guidance on KYC, um, is there any website you could maybe tell our attendees about to go to uh, so that they can maybe download some material and some guidance about that? I think there's a... You know, one of the authoritative sources of information for all of AML processing is the FFIEC handbook. I think yes. it's got great, great information. I mean, it's a, you know, bring it to bed, it'll put you to sleep. But it really does have, I mean, the depth and detail you really want to dive into. Um, if you can master the the information that's in that book, um, you're you're well on your way to understanding what your systems really need to accomplish. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, our next question is about something that was mentioned earlier in the presentation. Uh, what is a typical project duration to achieve the enhanced account and entity discovery that you uh, were speaking about before? So if we're talking specifically around the length, and is the question around the length of time in which it takes to come to positive results in a resolution in this? I believe that's what 
Is that the direction of the question? Um, I, I hope so. I'm not sure. I, I. All right. Let me let me answer that question. I won't throw it back on you. So traditionally, what we see is that um, a, a lot of technology organizations today who are doing this sort of stuff um, are looking to deploy technology that is modular. So the so the biggest thing to consider is is um, the first thing is to consider technology that's not going to disrupt either what you have already done or what's not a priority going forward. So it, you, you ought to look at, uh, and traditionally, and I'll, I'll speak for PB, uh, we don't do a big bang approach. Uh, we address it based on the modular technology that we have. Uh, we link in with what has already been deployed or is already being worked on and simply fill in the gaps and the holes uh, for that. Because of that, we traditionally look at an implementation that would last anywhere from six to eight weeks, could be 10 to 12, depending on the level of effort and the number of different data sources. But we're talking weeks, not months and years. Yeah, okay, interesting. Um, you know, the methodology that you describe in, throughout the webinar uh, about monitoring data quality, is that applicable irrespective of what system uh, a firm runs? Yeah, I think that, and I just wanted to pick up on your question and actually the first comment that Jeff made, and that is yeah. everyone on this call, everyone that runs an AML shop has invested, I'm going to guess, millions, if not tens of millions of dollars in these components. Uh, and to focus on data does not require removing those components. The focus on data is, is really a separate effort to make sure that the data that's coming into, especially because we're a the AML folks here, so we're going to be very AML centric, especially the data as it comes into the AML department uh, and is used in AML processes. Our, our thought, and you know, modular comes into it, but really our thought is that the things that you have invested in do not need to be changed. They don't need to be ripped out. They don't need to be replaced. Uh, what really needs to be is a focus on the data that's flowing through those systems. So putting in these systems to correct an address, correct a name, uh, bring that information together, parse, standardize, you know, those are all specific components that can be deployed, you know, prior and what I tried to show in the architecture like slide is uh, the information flows much like it does from all the lines of business through the AML processes and we're just interrupting it at one point and saying this is the point that it's coming into my shop, I'm going to fix it, I'm going to connect that information together, create that holistic view that Dom was talking about. And I'm also going to monitor it. I want to make sure that the data that's, you know, maybe I can give some feedback to some of these lines of businesses that your data is really not up to snuff, or maybe you ought to take another look at your KYC processes because the stuff we're ending up with is not all that good. Um, but th those are, that's just a, yeah, an interruption of the data flow and an improvement and enhancement of the data quality so that as it runs through your shop, you're getting the benefit of working with good data. And what would like a system like that typically cost? <laughs> <laughs> Can you give us any idea maybe? So that's a really hard question to answer because it, it depends on the size of the bank, the number of use cases that we are solving for and the, uh, uh, and the area in which we are resolving for. Because the technology is modular and there's probably 16, 18 different modules, in some deployments, our clients re require request two modules, and some of them it's all 18. So it's a very difficult question to answer. I would say, you know, the, the smaller opportunities that we work on range from about 100 to 200 thousand um, dollars. We've had some larger ones for some of the largest global banks in the world that um, range closer to 12 to 15 million. So there is a range that fits. Uh, it depends on what modules, what use cases, and the size of the bank that we are resolving this for. So, sorry, kind of a, a nebulous answer for you. No, that's all right. It's okay. Um, you uh, spoke earlier about a DQS score that you might give a firm. Uh, can you describe like what the approach would be to come up with a score like that? What's involved in a DQS score? Sure. So when we look at data quality, what we want to do is look at the different sources, right? First, to to score the overall the the, the bank's data quality, but Ideally, what we want to do is we want to understand which data sources, which lines of business are doing better at collecting this customer data and validating the information properly. Now, from a data quality perspective, there are a lot of different things, right? There's a name, there's an address, there's a date of birth, there's a government ID, and then a host of PII data that goes with it. 
So what we do is we look at it and we say, okay, if we're looking, we're not necessarily validating that my birth date is, you know, April 1st, you know, 1975, but that whether or not the data quality that resides within that enterprise is properly uh, listed based on the dates of birth components. So we, if we looked at all the different date variations, month, day, year, day, month, year, month where the month is written out, day where the day is written out, um, where the year comes first or not, is we look at data quality to say, is it standardized in a single unified format so that when it goes against other different uh, account holders that we're properly going to match day, month, year to day, month, year, not month, day, year versus day, month, year. Sorry, there's a lot of days and months in there. <laughs> but, uh, so that's, that's the biggest thing is, is to understand from a data quality perspective the format and variations of those key data elements. And then based on w what we come out of the box with is an understanding of what data elements have relative importance to the entire process. And we can create a, a total score based on different weighted averages by data element. Now, of course, we're not a black box and we can work and operate with whatever systems uh, or, or viewpoints the bank may have. So if you're going to put a heavier emphasis on, on an address than what we do or a, or a government ID than what we do, uh, or versus a date of birth or, or somebody's phone number, we can certainly do that. But having an assessment to understand what it is, uh, where the data is coming from and what it looks like is critically important. And that process, let me be clear, that process does not take very long. We're talking, so long as the data is there, we're, t we're talking days in order to accomplish that to give uh, a bank a viewpoint as to where they sit. I, I'm going to agree with everything Jeff said and make just one small change, and that is because uh, I have my AML hat firmly pulled onto my head today. When I talk about data quality scoring for an AML process, uh, very specifically what I would do is uh, evaluate, and we have a methodology to do this, is understand what the critical data elements are for the AML processes that you're responsible for and do an extract of, let's say, the, the customer data that is sitting in or being referred to by the transaction monitoring system. That's going to give me a good idea of exactly what am I monitoring and what quality, what, of what quality is the data that I'm leveraging to monitor, specifically in my scenarios. I want to make sure that those are high quality and I'm going to specifically score that on a regular basis to make sure it's up to snuff because I want to get the right answers and not generate a lot of noise in my alerting process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's probably important. Um, we don't actually have any more uh, questions from the audience, but I did want to ask you one more sum up question before we kind of finish up the webinar. Maybe each of you could give me sort of the one takeaway that you think is the most important from this webinar. So I'll start because it's easiest for me. <laughs> at, like at the end of the day, the, the reality is, is all the financial crime systems that you have uh, are put in place and they meet a regulatory requirement and they're going to provide you with the ability to detect suspicious activity. Now I'm talking whether it's a transaction monitoring system, whether it's your KYC and KYCC, whether it's your fraud system, your corresponding bank, it, it doesn't matter. But at the end of the day, if you don't put good customer data into that technology, and we'll talk in the next next webinar why it's so important to connect and create networks uh, of folks and, and specifically how, how it is that we've deployed it. But the reality is if you don't put good customer data in there, those systems are not going to properly be able to leverage and the use cases in there are not going to be able to properly build out the use cases and the scenarios in order to deliver the results that you need. Uh, I'll go next because we seem to be working backwards. Um, <laughs> my, uh, my thought is just very simple. You know, Data quality is not a walk in the park. It's not easy, but it's doable and it's necessary. Okay. Any last thoughts, Eden? Oh, I think you might be on mute. He doesn't have an answer. I have his answer. Okay. Um, I don't know. I don't know where he's, he's having some technical difficulties. I'm not sure. I, I would just further, I mean, Ali Don said he, he provided a lot of background to make a very specific point. Mm. The, the data quality is really needed in AML, and the regulators are asking and now pushing and being you know, more and more emphatic that you got to pay attention to this stuff. Yeah, it's becoming a very, very important issue. 
Um, yeah, and with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and conclude the webinar. Uh, special thanks, of course, to all of you speakers, Idan, Jeff, and Bob, uh, just for sharing all of your experience with us today. It was very insightful. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks for attending. Thank you. So on behalf of the NoMoneyLaundering.com team, I just want to thank you so much again for joining us today and have a great day further.